Archiving started. Welcome back. Um, welcome back to Lawrence Tech uh, University, our robotics engineering laboratory here in Southfield, Michigan. And this is part two of PID controllers, theory and practice. In part one, we went through some basic definitions and terms. Part two will be fairly quick. We're going to build a mathematical computer model of a DC motor, and then we can use that uh, model to uh, demonstrate the proportional integral and other control algorithms that we're going to be talking about. So here is the components of a DC motor. It may not look like a DC motor, but schematically this is what's there. Um, inside the motor you have um, you know, coils of wire around the, the rotor inside, and that coil of wire has a couple properties. It has a resistance that we're going to call R, and it has an inductance, which we'll call L. Um, if you don't know what inductance means, that's okay. Um, just, just roll with it and we'll move on. But um, we'll, uh, I, can't, <laughs> I can't cover everything in the world. Uh, so we'll just, you know, just, we'll just go on. And there's also inside the motor, um, you know, the, the rotor has some mass. That's a mechanical thing. And as that mass spins, you're spinning these coils of wire in the, the you know, magnetic field from the permanent magnets of a permanent magnet motor. And that spinning creates a voltage. And that voltage is what we call back EMF. And that voltage actually opposes the voltage that you apply from the source. Okay. The output of the motor is, of course, the rotation. Um, it rotates at some velocity. It generates some torque. It accumulates some total angles of rotation. And we can write equations describing all those bits and pieces that I just talked about. Um, we have a voltage supply that we're using to drive this motor. And then we have the components inside the motor. So by applying Kirchhoff voltage laws, I can say that the voltage drop across this resistor plus the voltage drop across that inductor plus this back EMF is going to be equal to the voltage source that I apply. That's this equation right here. Uh, I can tell you quite simply through Ohm's law that the voltage drop across this resistor is the current through this wire times that resistance. That's that equation right there. And for this inductor, we get a little bit more complicated in terms of the equation, but the voltage across that inductor is equal to the inductance L times the derivative of current with respect to time. Okay? And there's that calculus that we talked about in video one again. Um, when I said it describes how things work in the real world, here's just another example. You can't, you can't get away from it. On the mechanical side, um, we have some torque generated by the motor. Presumably, we have some torque being absorbed by whatever is attached to this motor, because there wouldn't be much point in having a motor if we didn't put a load on it. And that leaves us, the difference of that is some net torque. Now, if the motor is producing more torque than the load is absorbing, it can accelerate, right? And we can apply Newton's law here to say that the acceleration is the net torque divided by the uh, rotational inertia. And given acceleration, as we pointed out in the first, um, first video, given acceleration, I can integrate that and I come up with speed. I can take the speed, integrate speed, and I come up with the angle, more calculus. Okay? And then in between the electrical equations and the mechanical equations, we have these two equations right here. Um, the bottom one here says that the torque of the motor is some constant, a proportional constant, times the current. Okay, So the current on this side times that value K gives me torque on the mechanical rotation side. And for that back EMF, I know that the back EMF is some constant, a proportional constant, times the speed of the motor. So that, so the rotation of the motor generates a voltage right here, this back EMF, which opposes the flow of current from our external source. So these two equations are really the equations that couple the electrical side with the mechanical side. 
Now we could uh, sit down and work these out and come up with a set of differential equations to make our model directly, but I'm going to take the lazy way out and the easier way for, I think, for people to understand if you're not that conversant with calculus. And we'll just take each equation and implement it directly into our simulation tool. We're going to use Simulink, which is a component of MATLAB. Um, but let's, let's start with this equation right here. What, 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 what could we do with this? Well, I know that VL here is, is kind of a funny thing here. So if I, if I solve this equation for VL, I get VL, the voltage drop across the inductor, equals VS, the voltage source that I'm applying to my battery or power source or whatever, minus the voltage drop across the resistor, VR, minus the um, this back EMF term, VB. Okay, so there's my equation, VL equals VS minus VR minus VB. And if I go to MATLAB Simulink, I can graphically build that. I can take my VS that comes here, that's plus. I can subtract the VB, and I can subtract right here this VR, and my output there is that VL. That's so this is, this right here is that same equation put in this graphic format. Going back to the page, um, I now have, I have VL that I've calculated. Um, what I really want is current because it's current here that gives me my torque. So I can say that, rearrange this equation and say that di by dt, use my handwriting, equals vl over l, okay? So I just take my output, for, take my value of vl divided by l, I get the derivative of current at the time. Given the derivative of current, what's the antiderivative? What undoes the derivative? Integration, like we talked about in the first video. So I can take di by dt, I can integrate it to the integral of di by dt equals i, which is what we'll want here for, for this torque calculation. And it also it's uh, what we use here in our calculation of the voltage drop across the resistor. Okay? So going back here. I had my VL, I divide by L here, 1 over L, and this gives me dI by dt. I integrate it, that's an integral there, okay, and my output here is now I, that's the current. Take that current multiply by the resistance, and I get the voltage drop across the resistor. Take that current, multiply it by this constant in the torque equation, I get the torque of the motor, and so on. And we can do the same thing on the other side, where we take the acceleration, integrate it to get the speed. We take the speed, we integrate it again, we get the angle. And the other piece that we have in here is, of course, the feedback. Given the speed, we feed back that back EMF, and I've also added a load, an external torque that I'm going to apply at 15 seconds in the simulation to simulate something happening outside the motor. So here's how it runs. When I run this simulation in MATLAB, um, I apply 10 volts starting at one second, just a constant 10 volts, and here I've, I've plotted the voltage times 10, so it's you know, it says 100, but it's really just 10. So it's easier to see and plot if I multiply it by 10 first. At 15 seconds, I apply this disturbance. Probably should have picked a different color for that. And this blue line is the speed of the motor. It starts out, speeds up, speeds up, kind of comes close to a steady state here. I apply this external load. It slows it down, and it stabilizes like that, okay? Now, this isn't any particular real electric motor. It's 
I picked most of these constants based on it makes a nice plot for illustrating what I need to illustrate. But since obviously since you won't be controlling the same motor I might be controlling, it doesn't matter. It's just it's a what we're producing here is a plant that we can work with. And this graph here on the right is the accumulated angle, right? It's accumulated because we have an integrator, integrate velocity to get angle, and we start out at zero when the simulation starts, and we get up close to uh, 10 to the fourth, so that's 100,000 degrees over the course of that 30-second operating. So we'll take this motor model, and we'll, we won't do much with the details of the motor. I just wanted to show you how I put it together and, again, point out how calculus is really a, the language we need to use, like it or not. Um, but um, So we'll take this motor, and in the next, next uh, three parts, really, we'll take that model, we'll apply proportional control, integral control, and PI control, then we'll go on to some practical considerations, tuning, and then finally we'll control position instead of just velocity. So that winds up part two. I hope you found that at least somewhat interesting. And hold on to your hats because we're going to actually start talking about PID controllers in the next video. Thank you.